Good morning. This is Steve from Southern Illinois. This is a companion piece for the Sabbath devotional, The Shoebox. And thank you for joining us. Our topic today is Ears to Hear. How did Jesus talk to people who were outside his religious group? What perspective did he give us in how to communicate the gospel to non-Christians? <clears throat> so let's start with Matthew chapter 13 and let me get my Bible. That's just to give you a chance to run get yours too. Chapter 13, verses 9 through 15. Jesus has just finished telling a parable. A parable of the sower that we dealt with previously in one of our other text talks. And he ends his parable by saying, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it's not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing they shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their hearts and should be converted, and I should heal them. Why did Jesus preach in parables? His answer harks back to Calvin's conclusion that God elects some people for salvation and some others for damnation. That whether we hear or not is not up to us. God decrees it. Only the elect can hear and understand. I find that conclusion difficult to fit with other passages in Scripture. And even here, <clears throat> he talks about their ears being plugged up with fat and their eyes being dull. Now, I've already dealt with that perspective in, in a previous talk. So uh, if you are if you wanted to look at for an alternative perspective to what Calvin presented, then I suggest you visit the text talk on Broken Connections given on November 11, 2020. The point here, though, is that Jesus taught in parables because people had understa difficulty understanding when he spoke clearly. When you speak clearly to someone who already is having difficulty understanding, very often what you end up doing is only confirming them in their own belief. In other words, you dull their minds, you dull their perceptions, and you actually make it harder for them to hear in the future. 
So Jesus used a different method of communication. Parables. Stories. In Matthew 13, 34 and 35, so further on down in the same chapter where Jesus, uh, where we were reading previously, it says, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Very often we hear that first part of that. Jesus only spoke to the multitude, to the crowds in parables. And we miss what he's saying in the second. Okay? The parables are not just interesting stories. He is sharing secrets that were hidden from, from the foundation of the world. If he's sharing secrets, why isn't he sharing them plainly? That's a question that we need to delve into. In John chapter 16, Jesus is talking to the disciples. It's the night before his betrayal and crucifixion, and he's trying to prepare them for what, to, what is to come. But in verses 12 to 15, he says, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of myself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he hath received of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore I said that I, therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. And then in verse 25, in the same line of thought, he says, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Matthew speaks, talks about Jesus speaking in parables to the crowds. Now, here John talks about Jesus speaking to the disciples in Proverbs. The Greek words are closely related. One is a noun. The other is actually a verb, as best I can tell from, from reading my Greek dictionaries. Okay. But they're essentially the same. The difference is that the word used in John is usually used for what college people call aphorisms, pithy sayings, snappy sayings, okay? Um, whereas a parable is more extensive. It's a story. But it doesn't change the fact that both of them are efforts to communicate a, an idea, a concept, without coming out with a formal, logical presentation of the concept. They're alternative ways of communication. And the disciples were struggling to understand what Jesus was meaning by these aphorisms, these proverbs that he was speaking to them. And when he said that he was speaking clearly, in verse 25, uh, he then went on, At that day you shall ask in my name, and you sh I shall say unto you that I will, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came forth from the Father and am, co am come into the world. Again I leave the world and go to the Father. And the disciples said to him, Lo, now you're speaking plainly and speak no proverb. 
They had no idea what he was saying, but they wanted him to know that they thought they understood. Why do I include this text in our chain reference, which is what we're doing today as a chain reference Bible study? Why do we include that? Well, I include that because it points out that the crowds were not the only ones that had difficulty understanding what Jesus was saying. The disciples did too. At the end of his parables, Jesus often said, he who has ears to hear, hear. If you've got ears, listen. He's essentially saying the same thing to the disciples here. So we as Christians cannot take this better than thou attitude of there are folks out there who don't understand. Yeah, they they have hearing difficulties, but we understand. Are we any different than the disciples? I think we have as much difficulty understanding what God is trying to communicate to us in our lives as the people out there. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. This is from John's vision of the angel messengers to the churches, the seven churches. And at the end of each one of the messages, there's a passage like this. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Speaking to the church of Ephesus, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Multiple times in the book of Revelation, John says, He that has an, hath an ear to hear, let him hear. The same message is, is given for us today in the book of Revelation, as Jesus gave to his listeners sitting on the hills of Galilee 2,000 years ago. If you have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit has to say. How did Jesus talk to people outside his religious group? He used parables. He used stories. In Luke chapter 24, which we didn't read, let's go back and read that. Okay. Luke chapter 24, verse 27, and then again with 44 and 45. This is, the, these are experiences after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. And the first one happens during the walk on the road to Emmaus. Jesus is walking with Two of his disciples, not of the twelve, but two of his disciples, um, and they don't recognize him, but they get he strikes up a conversation with them, and then it says in verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This is the first time in the Gospel of Luke, or in any of the Gospels, where there's a record of Jesus going step by step through the scriptures, even with the disciples. And then verse 44 and 45. Now Jesus is in the upper room with the disciples, who uh, not all of them are believing that he's actually resurrected. He's having to try to convince them. <clears throat> and 
And in 44, it reads, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. What's my conclusion with this? Why am I sharing this series of Bible texts? Jesus spoke to the crowds using parables. He spoke to his disciples using aphorisms, pithy sayings. He told them that his life was a fulfillment of the prophecies of Scripture, but that we only have a record after his resurrection of him actually sitting down and going through those prophecies and demonstrating his fulfillment of them for his disciples. Now, in Jesus' day, there were four ways of teaching that we can deduce from reading the literature of his times. One was using parables, stories that communicated a meaning, but that didn't spell out the meaning. I'm not talking about the, and the meaning of the story is, now, very rarely did Jesus do that for his audiences. Okay. Second, aphorisms, pithy sayings. Uh, you will find entire books of aphorism, aphorisms written in, uh, in Christ's time and in the, the thousand years after him. Okay. Even today in, in parts of the world, an aphorism is much more powerful than some of these other methods of communication at convincing people of the truth of what you're saying. And don't we understand that in our culture? What do you think the jingles of advertising are? They're just aphorisms. We know the power of aphorisms today. We just don't think of them as communicating truth. We think of them as selling products. They change minds powerfully. Okay? Uh, the third method of, of um, convincing people was called logic. Okay? And it's close to what we mean today when we talk about a logical exposition. Most preaching today uses logic as its primary mode of communication. We try to present evidence, draw conclusions, and then apply the conclusions to life. The third method was rhetoric, or what we call oration or persuasive speaking. That's kind of fallen out of favor in our, our day. Um, we, our presidents still have speech writers. Those are specialists in rhetoric. But most of the rest of us don't think of ourselves as giving orations. And yet, on my shelves, I have books that are prepared for salespeople and business people. Uh, one of them is called Life is a Presentation. We don't call them orations today. We call them presentations. But the techniques of doing a good presentation are really the techniques of rhetoric, of persuasive speaking. So we basically, in sharing what's important to us, we have a choice between parables, stories, aphorisms, pithy sayings, logic, exposition, and rhetoric, presentation. What I'm suggesting to you today that is when we are communicating something meaningful to us, to an audience that is listening from a different frame of reference. If I'm a Christian, speaking to a post-Christian audience or a secular audience or a audience composed of people of another religion. 
Jesus spoke to them in parables. He did not present a logical exposition, which in Christian circles, that translates to an appeal to the authority of Scripture. The Bible says, therefore, therefore. Jesus didn't use that technique with his, his audience. Even the times when he said, you have heard it said, that form is, is the literary form of his day for presenting an aphorism. Okay? You've heard this said. You've heard this aphorism, this pithy saying, but I say unto you, this pithy saying, a very different technique, method of communication than logic. So what I would suggest is that when you're trying to share the gospel, share what God has done for you in your life, instead of an appeal to scriptures, tell a story. Tell your story. It will be much more powerful than logic, than oration, even than an aphorism. Tell your story. That's what I wanted to share with you today. Fairfield Seventh-day Adventist Church is dedicated to Christ's ministry of providing protection. That means we treat each other with respect. And what I'm talking about today with you is a part of the culture of respect that is important to us. When we treat other people with respect, we are communicating that it is safe to be here. When we treat them with disrespect, we are communicating you have to belong to us to be safe. There's a world of difference. Have a good day, and I'll see you next week.